Welcome everyone. I'm Greta Essig and I manage the Andrew Carnegie Fellows Program at Carnegie Corporation of New York. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our forum on the evolving nature of rights and who or what they protect. During the next hour, we will be looking at new research that looks at human rights, immigrant rights, the right to remain anonymous, and rights in the natural world. Before we get started, a little background. The fellowship was created in 2015 by our past president, Vartan Gregorian, who died last spring. We miss Vartan and are proud to continue his tradition of supporting outstanding scholarship in the social sciences and humanities. Since its inception, the program has awarded 216 fellowships, representing 43 million in support for these fields. Check out our fellows and their research projects on our website at carnegie.org slash ACF. If you have your smartphone handy, scan the QR code on your screen to link to the program page. We launched the Fellows Forum series last year to highlight the contributions of our fellows whose scholarly research addresses important issues confronting our society. During today's discussion, we invite you to share your thoughts online using the hashtag Carnegie Fellows. I'd like to take a moment to thank our partners for co-sponsoring this event with us today. The Center for American Progress, the Migration Policy Institute, and New America. As you may know, one of our Car Carnegie Fellows, Asmat Khan, was scheduled to moderate today's forum. The good news is that she was able to get into Kandahar, Afghanistan for her research on the rights of civilians during wartime. The bad news is that we learned last minute that she could not join the forum because of her logistics combined with unreliable internet service. We were able to pre-record a video with Asmat about what she is seeing on the ground, which we will play in just a moment. Asmat is an award-winning investigative journalist, a New York Times Magazine contributing writer, an assistant professor of journalism at Columbia University, and a Future of War fellow at New America. With support from her Carnegie Fellowship, Asmat is working on a new book that investigates America's air wars titled Precision Strike. Let's watch the video recording of Asmat speaking from Afghanistan. Hi, my name is Asma Khan, and I just want to give my apologies for not being able to be there in person for the live event. But fortunately, the upside is that I'm here in Afghanistan, able to do a lot of the reporting that was the basis for my own Carnegie Fellowship. And Afghanistan has probably been generating attention in the United States that it has not received for years. This war has been on the forefront of many American minds. And one of the things that has really captured people's attention amidst this withdrawal was a US drone strike in late August intended to target what the United States called an ISIS facilitator, what was believed to be a car bomb. In about three weeks, many in the American public watched American claims about that car bomb claims of intelligence, of packages of weapons, of an ISIS facilitator, of a compound, of explosives and secondary explosions, they watched those claims fall apart. Now, for many, this was the first time that they saw that kind of intelligence get deconstructed and American claims not only be refuted by journalists and others, but actually be conceded by the Pentagon. The Pentagon admitted just a few days ago that the family that was targeted in that airstrike were all civilians, that there was some kind of grievous error made. And the same day that the Pentagon made that announcement, I was actually sitting with them in Kabul. And their experience is one that really is not all that unique in America's war on terror. They are individuals who were conflated for being combatants in war. People whose movements were monitored via aerial surveillance, via signals intelligence, which are really just cell phone intercepts, and who were believed to be guilty despite the fact that they were innocent. Now, for many, this may seem like an anomaly, and in some ways it was. It was an anomaly because there were so many journalists here in Kabul ready to cover that story and investigate what went wrong. 
It was an anomaly because neighbors had smartphones and were able to record footage of the aftermath of that event and people were able to geolocate it instantly. And it was an anomaly because it took place in an urban center where NGOs had security footage and people were very easily able to retrace the steps of the driver of that vehicle. Most of America's airstrikes actually take place in rural areas, areas that are extremely hard to access in Afghanistan. But it's actually been the basis of my work for several years now. And what I'm doing here right now is actually sampling rural areas to understand not just how many civilians are dying as a result of US airstrikes, but what their experiences of war have been like when so few journalists have been able to reach many of these communities to document their deaths and to really illustrate what the impact, the human impact of war is. And all of that really ties into our conversation today about rights, because so much of the war in Afghanistan as it's been constructed in American media, in some American scholarship, has been told through urban centers like Kabul, through rights of particular groups, rights of women, but constructed around many of those in urban centers. And so some of those individuals who live in these battlefield provinces, these areas that are harder to access, some of their rights have actually come at the expense in this war and aren't really analyzed or talked about or given the kind of due process that is really needed to understand what this war really looks like. And so what I've been doing is sampling different villages, places where not just airstrikes were happening routinely, but night raids by American partners in Afghanistan. And a lot of what I've been learning is that much of what has occurred here has actually contributed to the Taliban's rise, that some airstrikes have resulted in widespread civilian death. And you know what we saw in Kabul has been perpetrated elsewhere in many of these rural areas in extremely high amounts, amounts that actually many of the statistics that Americans have relied on for years, for example, the United Nations numbers about civilian loss, that those numbers are extreme undercounts of how many civilians have actually died. I've been working in Kandahar and Helmand provinces on this, on this latest trip, but in the past, I've looked at places including Nangarhar and Kunar in the east, but these are really heartlands, the places where the United States poured the most amount of aid money, the most amount of resources and capital in terms of human soldiers in trying to retake territory from the Taliban. And what I've been finding is that in many of these places, it's not just the death toll is higher, but our entire understanding of the costs of this war have really been skewed not to necessarily take into account the views and perspectives of many of these people. I've met children who have never once experienced a day without war until this war recently ended. And if you look at the coverage of the war in Afghanistan, particularly during the drawdown, you don't necessarily see that reflected. These are voices that we don't hear. And yet it is an impact. It is a result of the American project in the country that has for too long been ignored. So I'm I'm very fortunate to be able to do this research thanks to my Carnegie Fellowship. I'm grateful to so many others who, you know, have supported this work and are paying attention even when Afghanistan was not making headlines. And I'm, I'm very sorry not to be joining this conversation, which I was so looking forward to with scholars that I really respect and admire and was looking forward to learn from. But I'm sure that they'll have a wonderful discussion and I look forward to staying in touch online. To fill in as moderator for Asmat Khan, we invited a friend of Carnegie Corporation of New York to join us, Sri Srinivasan. Sri is the inaugural Marshall R. Loeb Visiting Professor of Journalism at Stony Brook University's School of Communication and Journalism. Previously, he was the Chief Digital Officer of Columbia University, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the City of New York. In 2013, Shri was named a great immigrant by Carnegie Corporation. Thank you for moderating today, Shri. Hello, and thank you, Greta. It's such an honor to be with all of you today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Today, our conversation will explore rights, 
how we have historically defined human, civil, and natural rights, and whether we should broaden those definitions to reflect society's current challenges. Three Andrew Carnegie Fellows are joining us to talk about rights in their fields, Batsheba Demuth, Jeff Kosef, and Cecilia Menhivar. Our first panelist, Jeff Kosef, is a cybersecurity law professor at the US Naval Academy. In 2019, he published a book titled The 26 Words That Created the Internet, which qu quickly established him as a leading expert on Section 230. This is the hotly debated law that protects tech companies such as Facebook and Twitter from being held legally liable for content posted by users on their platforms. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. Moving on from freedom of speech, I gather that the subject of your Carnegie Fellowship is the history of the right to anonymous speech in the United States. Can you provide an overview of your findings for your upcoming book? So I'm so happy to be here. And uh, this has just been a fascinating examination over the past few years of the role that anonymity has played in the American experience and American democracy. And what I've found is that going all the way back to the, even before the founding of America, anonymous speech has been so critical for dissidents uh, to communicate unpopular views that might've gotten them prosecuted for things like sed seditious libel. Um, it was fundamental for foundational documents like common sense that Thomas Paine wrote anonymously to make the case for independence as well as the Federalist Papers, which were published under a pseudonym in argument for the adoption of our constitution. So uh, the ability for people to uh, disassociate their names from their speech has been very fundamental to America going back to its founding. Thank you. And you did address this a little bit in your remarks, but if you can tell us how was anonymous speech un understood and emphasized and handled during the founding of the United States? It, it was so common um, to have really important debates about the future of the colonies and then uh, of uh, really the, the American experiment um, because uh, for, for a variety of reasons, in part, uh, it was literary effect that, you know, if you sign something as Publius or a farmer from Pennsylvania, that might have a different effect than just signing your name as a lawyer or a politician, but also to be able to really have these frank and candid conversations where it's your argument rather than your identity that drives the debate. So, I mean, for when uh, the Articles of Confederation were not a successful first attempt at our government, uh, you had Federalists who were arguing in favor of uh, what we have now is our constitution, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, but you also had, and they wrote under Publius, uh, you also had anti-federalists, uh, the federal farmer uh, writing in their pseudonyms. And this whole debate that really shaped our democracy took place uh, largely under pseudonyms rather than people's real names. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Supreme Court and when did it first recognize that the First Amendment protects anonymous speech and how has the court applied this protection over the years? So the, the first real recognition of the First Amendment rights to anonymity came in the post Brown versus Board of Education 1950s, um, where you had uh, the NAACP really working uh, to desegregate schools. And uh, you still had a lot of state officials in Alabama in particular, also Arkansas, who were really trying to fight that. Uh, the first case, this uh, happened in the 1950s, where um, Alabama basically used a loophole in a state corporation's registration law to try to shut down the NAACP in Alabama. Um, and as part of that shutdown or attempted shutdown uh, in the court case, the state tried to force the NAACP to give a list of all of its members. Now, obviously, in the 1950s in Alabama, there's a good reason why the NAACP members would want to be anonymous. Um, and this case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court unanimously says that the First Amendment right to association protects the uh, NAACP from the compelled disclosure of their members. And then building on that throughout the 1960s and beyond, what you had were 
cases involving state and local laws that required people to sign their names to handbills and political pamphlets. And the Supreme Court uh, said that basically the government needs to have a very compelling and narrowly tailored justification for these restrictions on anonymity. And the court really specifically pointed back to the founding and the importance of anonymity in our de democratic system. Right. I want to go fast forward a little bit to the Internet age and First Amendment and online issues. How have the courts applied the First Amendment's right to an anonymity to the Internet? And have these decisions, how have they impacted society? So the courts have found a strong but not absolute right to anonymity online. And this really started in the late 1990s. For those of us who can remember Yahoo Finance, that was a bulletin board where every publicly traded company had people posting about them. There were often employees who had very unflattering things to say about their executives. Uh, this really rankled the executives like you couldn't imagine. And so they would uh, try to use the court system to unmask these critics and they would sue for defamation and they would try to basically get the identifying information from Yahoo and the ISPs. And at first they were really successful. No one really knew how to challenge it. But soon enough, in the early 2000s, the courts basically set very high standards, uh, not impossible, but basically you have to have a really strong case and you can't just sue for defamation and immediately expect to unmask this employee so you could fire them. And uh, so the courts really, uh, and, and that, that allows the existence of sites that we know today like Glassdoor, uh, where people can be fairly candid about uh, their experiences working at companies. I like that you called it fairly candid because they can be very direct. Uh, we'll do one more question and then we'll go to the audience questions that we've been that we've been getting. In an age when companies amass data about our location, internet activities, facial recognition, is it possible to remain anonymous even with this protection that the First Amendment offers? So it's much harder. The First Amendment protects against government action. So if it's a court subpoena that's trying to force the disclosure, if it's a government real name requirement, that's covered by the First Amendment. But when it's private companies amassing data that we're and you and doing some pretty nefarious things with them, uh, it, it's a lot harder. Uh, that's why in, in the final part of my book, I call for strengthened privacy laws that can help to uh, to continue to uphold these values of anonymity that have been so important to our country. Thank you. In European countries, there is a right to have personal data erased by internet companies. How does this work? And what are the chances we'll see something like this in the US? So th this came about six years ago, the European Court of Human Rights uh, said that basically Google would have to, if there's a sufficient privacy interest, people could request that Google or other search engines, but pretty much Google, uh, de-index those searches from the results. So if you were arrested for a minor crime 20 years ago, you could perhaps have it so that you can't, and a future employer can't Google you and find that information. Uh, it's also been incorporated to their uh, few-year-old privacy law. Now, uh, in the United States, we have some deletion rights of data that people provide to companies, but nothing like the right to be forgotten. Uh, I don't think that we could have a right to be forgotten in the United States uh, because our First Amendment values are just frankly much stronger than the free exp expression rights in Europe or really most of the rest of the world. Thank you. We'll do one more audience question and then we'll continue with our webinar. And everybody who's watching, please continue to tweet using the hashtag Carnegie Fellows. Now, here's a question that came in. What is your take on Apple's new tool to combat child pornography, which also has a new name that folks are using instead of child pornography as well, child sexual abuse material? Does it violate users' rights? And are we likely to see widespread adoption of the safeguards? So um, it's something actually, it, it's it's an issue that companies have been dealing with for a long time. Uh, Apple's announcement of what they were doing on the device uh, was not rolled out very well. Um, and it was not very well explained, but actually um, 
server cloud service providers, email providers, um, they routinely scan uh, for hash values of known child sex abuse material. And that actually raises some pretty substantial Fourth Amendment issues if the companies work too closely with the government. So the challenge that Apple and all these other companies have is they really don't want their services being used for child sex abuse material, uh, and they want to fight that. But if they work too closely with the government, then a defendant could raise this as a reason to suppress all the evidence. So it's something I've written quite a bit about in some articles, not really in this book, but it's a real challenge for the companies and for law enforcement. Thank you, Jeff. We'll see you again in a few minutes during our roundtable discussion. Thank you. Next up, please welcome our Andrew Carnegie Fellow and expert on immigrant rights, Cecilia Menhivar. Cecilia is Professor and Dorothy L. Meyer Social Equities Chair at UCLA. She studies the experience of immigrants in the United States, specifically the in-between legal status that many face. Her research shows this state of limbo can go on for decades due to gaps and inconsistencies in federal immigration law. Hello and welcome. So to start things off, what are some examples of the types of rights that documented immigrants have compared to undocumented immigrants? Yes, um, thank you, Sri. Thank you for the question. And um, I'm very happy to be here participating in this discussion as well. Um, yes, that is a very important question because there are many public misperceptions about the rights of immigrants. And so we know that um, U.S. immigration law does not allow anyone who, who wants to come into the country to be able to come in. That is the purview of the U.S. Congress to set the, the limit on the number of immigrants who come in each year, for what reason and under what circumstances. However, once people are in the country, the U.S. Constitution guarantees certain fundamental rights to everyone, to immigrants, even to undocumented immigrants. And I stress this because there is a myth, a misperception, that undocumented immigrants don't have rights. Well, they do. Um, they do have some rights that the U.S. Constitution guarantees to everyone on U.S. soil. For instance, they have the right to protection from discrimination based on race and national origin freedom of speech and religion, right to privacy, protection against unlawful search and seizure, and against self-incrimination, among other rights that U.S. citizens enjoy. They also have a right to K through 12 education, and they also have to receive wages, fair wages for the work they perform, and the right to work in a healthy and safe work environment. So these are rights that immigrants, even un including undocumented immigrants, share with everyone who is who, who lives who is in US soil. Now I also have to mention the rights that immigrants don't have. So for instance, depending on their legal status, some immigrants um, immigrants may have many immigrants don't have the right to vote. Undocumented immigrants don't have the right to vote. Lawful permanent residents, the so-called green card holders, don't have the right to vote in, in uh, general elections and, and even in many state elections. And um, But once immigrants acquire citizenship through naturalization, they do acquire the right to vote and they can run for office as well, except of course the office of the, of the president of the United States who needs to have been born in the United States. And so they have um, many rights that, in, uh, that US citizens enjoy, but um, there's a misperception that they may not have all the rights that other people have. Thank you, that was very informative to know about these rights that uh, they do have. But those who do know those rights, how likely are they to exercise those rights? Yeah, this has become quite difficult because even though we know that immigrants, and I, I, I stress undocumented immigrants and immigrants who are in this limbo temporary statuses um, have certain rights, guaranteed certain rights, 
And, and, the, and the immigrants themselves may be fully aware of the rights they have. What happens is that they are often unable to exercise them. This often happens because others know, don't know that immigrants have rights and start to treat them as such, as people without rights. And so it is at this point where immigrants' rights become vulnerable to, to violations. For instance, um, from research, we know, excuse me, that undocumented immigrants are especially prone to labor rights abuses, experiencing wage, wage theft, minimum wage violations, safety and other work violations. In my own research, I have come across many instances of immigrants in temporary statuses or undocumented being fully aware of the rights they have or the labor rights they have, but being afraid to exercise them because they fear being fired on the spot sometimes. This happens because employers, co-workers, and others simply assume that an undocumented or a temporary status equates with lack of protections, which is not true. And sometimes immigrants themselves start to think that they have no rights. And this is concerning because when people start to think that they are not like other members of society, that they don't have rights, that they are inferior to others, that they have no place in society, we all lose. We, that reverberates to, to, the, to all society and starts to, to, uh, to put um, democracy um, in, in a, in, um, at, at risk. Um, mm -hmm. So this is, this is, yes. And you're right, you know, that pro the process itself has been described as broken. What will it take to create a bipartisan consensus uh, as to the next step for undocumented immigrants living in limbo? Um, in my research and that of others, we have seen that the detrimental effect that undocumented status and also temporary statuses such as DACA or temporary protected status may have on the immigrants and, and on, their, on their life chances. The effect of legal status on immigrants' potential, on their integration, on their successful is really critical. It is so much so critical that research today compares the effects of legal status to the effects that social class, race, and gender have for people's life chances. It affects um, legal status, affects individuals' trajectories, but also their children's prospects for the future. So legal status has, um, has a that affects entire families, entire communities. And so one, um, a priority should be to create mechanisms to extend undocumented immigrants a more secure status and to those who are tempora in temporary statuses of various kinds to extend to them a permanent um, lawful status. Now we know that a more secure status is not automatically a guarantee for people to, to have rights or to not have their rights violated. Otherwise, look at the experience of minoritized populations in the United States whose rights are violated um, regularly. However, a secure legal status for immigrants is a, is a crucial starting point to bring people up to the point where they can at least know that they can exercise their rights. And so uh, a bipartisan effort should be focused on, 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 these, on these mechanisms to, to move people to more secure statuses. Thank you. We'll go to a question from our audience. How does US immigration law compare with that of other countries? Is the US unique or part of a global pattern? It's um no, the United States is not unique in this in this case, in this situation. Uh, many other large immigrant receiving countries um, have adopted similar policies and similar strategies to control immigration 
they all they have been the the use of temporary statuses, for instance, has been expanded, and more and more, even in the receiving countries, are using um, temporary statuses um, as a way to control migration. More and more immigrant receiving countries are adopting very similar enforcement practices, detention, deportations. And so the United States is not um, on its own on, in this regard. However, the United States, we, we have the, the narrative of being a, a country of immigrants. So in that respect, the United States um, stands in a, in a, on a different plane because of how we think of the nation as a nation of immigrants. But at the same time, it adopts the same policies and the same strategies to deal with immigrant immigration and with immigrants as well. Thank you. A very quick question and a quick answer. I hope should special considerations be given for children, and if so, what would that look like? Um, you know, the, it, this is a this is a very interesting question because, as as I just mentioned, legal status um, affects families, affects communities. And so even though legal status is granted on individuals, it reverberates to all members of families, all communities. So within a family, for instance, um, the, uh, the legal status of a parent affects their, their children. Even US born children are affected by the legal status of the, of the parent. So in a way, um, we, we need to think of legal status as not a, as an individual um, um, right or as an individual um, um, path to access goods and services of societies, but as a as a as a family um, as a family um, right. And so, um, children would be included. And um, special considerations for children should be kept in mind as we think of their immigrant parents as well. Thank you very much. We're going to do one more of our guests and then we will go get to a round table with all our speakers. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And now Thank please welcome you. our next panelist, Bathsheba DeMuth. Bathsheba is an assistant professor of history and environment and society at Brown University. She is an environmental historian who has lived and studied in Arctic communities. Her Carnegie Fellowship explores the potential for a framework of legal rights for non-human entities, similar to human rights for the natural world. Welcome. Thank you for being here. You write that we need a more ethical relationship between humans and nature. Could you tell us more about your findings and why your research is focused on the Yukon River in Canada? Well, thank you so much, Sri. Um, I'm interested in the Yukon River watershed in part because I'm an environmental historian. And so I work best when there's a specific ecological context that I can document as it changes over time. But the Yukon is also a place where there have been multiple rights and legal traditions um, interacting in this one uh, ecological space, this kind of unified watershed. Um, and you can see them interact across space and time. There are um, indigenous legal orders from the Yupik who live on the Yukon River's mouth um, up to which in country further upstream and many others. Then in the 19th century, the British and the Russian empires uh, both try to assert jurisdiction and bring their ideas of rights to the Yukon. And then in 1867, the watershed is split between the United States and Canada. So the result is that I have a kind of unified ecological space, many uh, kind of biological and geological processes that are shared across these jurisdictional lines um, that I can sort of watch interplay over time. So it's a really great place as a historian to examine how these um, ideas of rights have influenced the ecology and vice versa. And what a wonderful niche you've carved out for yourself. It's really uh, very special. Let's go to some questions. Uh, we'll start with the legal aspect of this. How are laws that protect the environment connected to laws that protect rights? Aren't they separate realms of authority? So you're absolutely right that in the Western legal tradition, particularly the British common law tradition that underlies both US and Canadian law, rights and environmental policy are enacted really differently um, and by kind of different aspects of our legal systems. 
And this, at the most fundamental level, has to do with who is given standing in these legal traditions. Um, it's human persons who are able to stand before a court as a rights-bearing subject. Rivers can be protected under this kind of division of legal labor, but they don't have standing in the court as bearers of inalienable rights uh, to things like life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And the rights of nature movement um, is, as Robert McFarland has termed it, um, kind of asking for a new sort of animism and asking that the legal system uh, find ways of being able to see ecological persons in addition to human persons. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about how you use history to explore these new concepts and how does your work differ from more traditional approaches? So I think of what an environmental historian can do with a set of questions like this, it's kind of two things. Um, the first is to offer kind of uh, empirically based narratives about how the past, uh, no matter what legal system in place, um, is one that's constructed by human beings making decisions and having ideas in the world, but also by the nature in which people are doing those actions, the environment around them. So in, environmental historians are often kind of trying to move us away from the idea that nature is the static object upon which um, our desires are enacted. It's always a part of how our decisions are made and our ideas are formed. Secondly, um, I see a historical approach as really complementary to what legal scholars and indigenous theorists working in the 21st century on this idea of rights of nature um, are trying to accomplish. Um, we're all really fundamentally asking if and how the law can help us create a society that is capable of sustaining itself environmentally and socially. Um, and whose legal traditions are of use uh, in this case. I'm looking at how this has worked in the past, which I hope will help uh, us understand and kind of orient our options in the present and the future. Thank you. What is the potential of expanding rights to include nature? And are there examples like that that make would be easy for us to understand about this working? Right, so the, the optimistic view of the rights of nature is that it would allow us as a society, kind of at a national level or a regional or a community one, to explicitly include the functioning and well-being of an ecosystem in our political decision making. So instead of thinking of it as a separate realm, one that only emerges when perhaps there's a crisis, um, it brings the, the kind of non-human world into our decision making practices more regularly. And there are several recent examples of this that you can watch um, in the United States. Most recently, this includes the White Earth Band of Ojibwe, who use their powers as a sovereign indigenous nation to make Manumen, which is uh, the Ojibwe word for wild rice, a legal person um, and are suing on the behalf of Manumen against the Line 3 oil pipeline project. And with the argument that this particular pipeline and what it would do to the ecosystems required for the flourishing of wild rice would kind of deny the right of Manumen to exist as a species as it has always done. And there are other examples in New Zealand and Colombia and India and Ecuador. There are some others in the United States. And the St. Lawrence River in Canada um, is also kind of in the midst of one of these rights of nature movements. Um, but we're early on in this in the contemporary moment. So it's kind of a thing to watch and see how it develops. Thank you. And uh, how does climate change affect this part of your work and how does it fit in with the research you're doing? Yeah, climate change fits in kind of in two major ways. Um, the first is that I'm really at kind of the most fundamental level interested in how a legal order develops that allows for climate change and mass extinction. Um, what are the power relationships in practice and what are the theoretical ideals of a system um, that is in the contemporary moment, really proving not up to the task of uh, sort of protecting the capacities of the planet to support life as we've known it. Um, in the United States and Canada, the, the legal system has not been particularly adept um, at meeting the challenges of these kind of large scale environmental issues. Um, and along the Yukon River, what I can do is watch how those legal systems have developed and what other alternatives have existed in the past um, and potentially still exist in the present. Um, particularly uh, because there are such a sort of rich corpus of indigenous legal traditions that still have uh, sovereign jurisdiction in places along the Yukon. So it's a place you can watch whether or not those are making different kinds of decisions that perhaps if enacted at scale uh, would have a different environmental impact. Thank you. Let's go to some audience questions. 
humans enforce human rights and sometimes they do it well and sometimes not so well. <laughs> what consequences might there be for violating non-human rights and who should be responsible for enforcing them? So this is uh, at a practical level, a question that's really still being worked out um, and will at the end of the day have to do with whether or not these non-human entities are found to actually have standing um, in courts. Generally speaking, what um, redress is being asked for uh, when Ben Newman uh, sues to stop the Line 3 pipeline, for example, um, is either the cessation of uh, activity that's seen as inherently destructive to a particular ecological space um, or financial redress in some cases, um, and are kind of using the apparatus of state courts and federal courts to try to, to come to that conclusion. Thank you. And how might, there's another audience question, how might natural rights work with individual property rights? So I think this is such an excellent question in the American context. Um, the U.S. inherited and has expanded upon a legal tradition that uh, has always emphasized private property as a key to political liberty. It's also a tradition that partitions the world into objects that can be owned and legal subjects that can do the owning. And until very recently in this country, legal subjecthood was restricted to white men. And that category is expanded, thankfully, to include black people and indigenous people and immigrants and women. But you can see from this example that when private property is invoked as the kind of the key to liberty or sort of the, the base of a functioning political system, we do need to ask for whom uh, those rights are actually being delivered because it's not universal. And you can see this if you are only paying attention to the human world in terms of the inequalities in property ownership today. But then if you add in the kind of twinned crises of climate change and mass extinction, um, I think the question becomes even more pertinent. How are we to deal with uh, property rights in the, in the present moment? If oil development, for example, endangers the livability of a particular place, uh, the viability of other species, um, or the capacity for present and future uh, human generations to live well in a stable climate, um, then that's actually fundamentally taking away liberties, both from, from non-humans and from people. I want the freedom to live in a stable climate as I grow older. I want that freedom for the children that I know. Um, and so asking whether or not, um, you know, private property rights are actually creating the kind of political society that we need in order to be able to sustain ourselves and the world that sustains us into the future, I think is a really important question. Thank you, Bathsheba. Now let's welcome back all three panelists. Okay, welcome. Uh, these perspectives on how we think about rights appear to challenge more traditional definitions. I would like to spend the rest of our time together, about 20 minutes, discussing some broader themes about rights and how they might impact your work. These questions were all submitted by our audience during registration for the forum. First, if it's true that when the Supreme Court's composition changes, our rights change, how can we truly possess rights? Or are they in actuality just temporary rights? So Jeff, I think there's a question for you. So um, it's a great question. And whenever you watch anyone's uh, confirmation hearing for the Supreme Court, one phrase that you will hear is stare decisis, which is Latin for to stand by things decided. And every justice and judge says, I believe in stare decisis, and which means I will adhere to precedent. Um, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's a good thing. I mean, we have some very bad precedent from a while ago that, had, that I think now is widely viewed as precedent that should be overturned. Um, but it also, as we're sort of seeing right now in uh, the debate over uh, the Texas SB8 and what the future of that might hold, uh, dependent, the composition can matter. So I think that's, it, it's a very good point. I would say that um, it does move slowly and there are a lot of factors that are not terribly predictable. Uh, for my anonymous speech work, for example, um, the justice who actually has been the most uh, vocal and most supportive of anonymous speech has been Clarence Thomas. Uh, who, which often surprises people, and uh, the late Justice uh, John Paul Stevens was probably the second most adamant. So it's hard to predict, but that, it, I, I mean, it, it is a valid point that uh, with nine people deciding these important issues, there can be, be changes uh, sometimes pretty quickly. Thank you. Let's go to get Cecilia to uh, weigh in on this as well. 
Um, in in the case in this case, for instance, um, for uh, for immigrants, as I mentioned, um, there's so much temporarily that has been introduced in legal statuses in how to to deal how to address um, issues that come up around immigration that um, that policies in and um, and treatment of immigrants changes so much all the time not only historically but even even as we speak and so it's it's um it 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 translates into public perceptions that are, are often confusing and, um, and and misinformed. And so there's quite a bit of, of uh, misinformation and misperceptions, mostly because so much of what we have in place in terms of US immigration law and, and policies and, stra and practices um, change. And um, immigration law does not change often, but um, policies on the ground and practices change quite a bit. And um, so it introduces um, uh, a, a sense of, of, of time is, is, of the, uh, is quite critical as things change and, and as more temporary statuses are introduced and, um, and as more pressing needs around the world are also um, introduced to the question. So I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not something static and it's something that, that needs to be thought about in, is, as, a, as a living matter more than as something um, structured and static. Thank you. Let's go to another question from our audience. How can we balance individual rights in the US with the interests of the global community where different countries have very different concepts? And Bathsheba, would you like to answer that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that one of the things that's really striking to me in the US legal system, particularly when compared to, um, I, I'm a historian of the Russian uh, spaces, either Imperial Russia or the Soviet Union originally. So I spent a lot of time thinking about more communitarian societies um, and that the ways in which the US system really privileges individual human beings over all else has some real upsides um, and some real uh, complications. And I think, um, at the question of environmental um, issues and climate change or mass extinction, any of these that we're dealing with on a global scale, learning to articulate the ways in which um, we have duties to other people in addition to rights to do things for ourselves is really important um, because the United States tends to uh, kind of privilege the, uh, the, the, the right to be free from something rather than the duty to care for or maintain or have obligations towards others. And I don't think this is a particularly sustainable thing in the realms of, of you know, fossil fuel emissions, for example. Um, and it would be nice if we could learn as a society to articulate those duties a little more clearly. Thank you. Another viewer asks, how can we legally enforce rights, particularly collective rights held by a group or negative rights such as freedom of speech We'll start with Cecilia on this. Um, uh, how do we um, enforce rights? I think um, we we have to look at the um, the tensions that exist between what the U.S. Constitution um, guarantees in terms of individual rights, what Bashiva was mentioning, and what U.S. immigration law does, and to bring those two in line. Um, enforce um, the, the exercise of rights and enforce that everyone knows that everyone has rights. When um, U.S. immigration law um, steps in and undermines the rights of immigrants, for instance, that the U.S. Constitution extends, we have a, we have a tension that needs to be resolved. And so I think that's um, something that needs to be looked into. What, um, what, what rights that the US Constitution extends to individuals um, are not being upheld when um, immigration laws and policies are put in place. All right, Jeff, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so this is actually something that I deal with a lot for a wide variety of online speech issues. So um, there are a lot of uh, sort of common law privacy rights uh, and uh, the ability also to sue for defamation. And uh, in the online space, there are some people uh, kind of on the opposite end of the Yahoo Finance glass door people I was talking about, but people who have had their lives ruined by stalkers, cyber harassers, and have very have a viable right to be able to recover for their reputation. But what we do in this, what, what the legal system expects of them is to file a lawsuit, which you say, okay, well, that's how you have to enforce your rights. But I've spent a lot of time interviewing and working with people who have been victims of uh, cyber harassment. And that is a huge burden to put on someone to say, okay, we're going to give you more publicity to what's happened to you, possibly subject you to more stalking which and harassment on a wide scale, which happens quite a bit. This often disproportionately affects women and minorities. And um, but but we say, yeah, we have these rights. And and, and I mean, I'm but but you're going to have to really. Um, suffer to exercise them. And I struggle with that quite a bit as I'm trying to, to figure out how, how do we make the internet safer? And there really are not easy answers to this, but I know the current system, at least in my field of research, really uh, places a huge burden on people who have been substantially harmed. And I think the revelations that came out this week about Facebook and Instagram just add to the importance of understanding these issues for all of us. So as we start to wrap up here, I'm gonna to come to each one of you with a question. How have these discussions informed your views of your own work and its potential impact? For example, do you see different applications or contexts? And do you have any particular takeaway that you would like to share based on the conversations? We'll start with Bathsheba. That's a great question. Um, I think that this question that we've just been talking about, um, Jeff and Cecilia, about the relationships between individual and collective rights is the one that I will leave this question or this conversation thinking about more. Um, I think it's a really important one um, within just kind of the realm of human law and how we relate to each other kind of within the, the human realms. But it's also one if we're trying to expand the um, kind of umbrella of who it is that can have rights um, because you know, that's just going to expand the opportunities for somebody to be kind of trampled or left out or or have to deal with a really onerous legal system in order to access rights that they have um, or potentially just kind of exclude them altogether. Um, and I think that, that that's not a new question in, in legal thinking, but it's one that this conversation has made me see more similarities between things like what is happening on the internet um, and what's happening with the status of salmon in the Yukon River, which are not things that I would have put together prior to this. Thank you. Let's go to Cecilia. Uh, yes, I, um, I, this, is a, this has been a very rich conversation because I would, have, um, I, I would not have thought, for instance, that my thinking about immigrant um, rights and legal status that is conferred on individuals and individual rights. Um, I've been thinking about them as, in the, as rights of families because legal status affects all families, the entire family. And so I'm um, thinking, uh, listening to Bathsheba, talking about the contrast that she sees between um, Russia and the Soviet Union uh, concept of rights in the United States where rights are, are extended to individuals. Um, aligns very well with my thinking about um, individual legal statuses and what it and and um, and the and legal status in the context of families and also um, rights that are constitutional extend constitutionally extended and conflicts with laws that may undermine accessing those rights. So this has been a very rich conversation and and. What Jeff brings up is also aligns quite, quite, quite closely with my thinking about um, immigrant, immigrants rights. So thank you for, for inviting me to, to share with them. Thank you, Cecilia. Let's go to Jeff for his final thoughts. So I, I think uh, both uh, Bathsheba and Cecilia have really reinforced my uh, desire to continue to look at not just what the rights are as judges write 
in court opinions and Congress passes in statutes, but how can they be effectively implemented? Uh, it, it's interesting Bathsheba was uh, talking about standing in environmental cases. Um, one of my next big projects is going to be a book about the concept of standing, which is this judge created doctrine that says only certain people can sue. Um, I came to this because I research cybersecurity and in a lot of cases where there's been a data breach and people's data has been stolen, uh, the courts have said, well, you don't have standing unless you've also had identity theft. And uh, they set all these weird rules. And I start, started looking at this and say, well, this is just kind of made up by judges in a way to prevent people from being able to enforce their rights. And sort of where it was initially made up was in a series of Supreme Court environmental cases. Um, so I, I think that this really has a wide range of applications across fields. And it's really been fascinating to hear about. Thank you. I want to wrap things up by thanking our fellows, Asma Khan, Bathsheba Demuth, Jeff Kosef, and Cecilia Menhivar. Thank you very much, folks. And also special thanks again to our partners for co-sponsoring today's forum, the Center for American Progress, the Migration Policy Institute, New America, and of course, Carnegie Corporation of New York. A few programming notes for our audience. Visit carnegie.org ACF to learn more about the Andrew Carnegie's Fellows Program, scholarly research, and future live stream events. You're invited to stay in touch by signing up for the foundation's newsletter at carnegie.org slash sign up. I'm Sri Srinivasan, journalism professor at Stony Brook University, friend of the corporation, and your moderator for today, filling in for Azmat Khan, who was unable to join us live from Afghanistan, but it was great to hear her thoughts to frame our conversation. Thank you to our audience for logging on today. We hope to see you again at another Andrew Carnegie Fellows Forum. In the meantime, follow the corporation on Twitter, at Carnegie Corp.